It's a solemn scripture reading, is it not? Yeah. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we are very, very grateful to be in this place and together and to worship you. Father, as we come with bowed heads, Lord, before you, Lord, we pray that you will open our eyes that we may see, open our hearts that we may see. Lord, that we may be redeemed. Please create in us clean hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The story is told of a poor family, father, wife, farmers, one son. And the family was living in the time where there was that overlap between farmers and city dwellers where there was a significant technological difference between the country and the city. Cars in the city farmland and oxen and horses and plows in the country. And the farmer and his wife raised their child and they scrimped and saved for his education. They put money aside to send him away one day to a good school because he was bright. Nobody in their family had education. Nobody had gone to college. They were farmers, they were poor. But they had self-sufficiency, and so over the years, a sacrifice was made to put money aside. And the day finally came, the boy had graduated from high school, he was a man, they sent him away to the city. I don't know if it was Boston, or if it was New York, I don't know if it was Harvard or Yale, but one of, one of the Ivy League schools. He had good grades and he had been accepted. The semester drew on and the farmer decided, I'm going to see my son. And so he hitched the buggy and the horse, the horse to the buggy, and they went into the city, given the horse. <clears throat> Through the streets of the city with the, the fumes and the, the fast moving cars, and they came to the school at last. And on the front steps, there was a crowd of young men. And the crowd of young men looked at this farmer pulling up in his horse and his cart. <clears throat> and they started to laugh. Look at this guy in this city, and he's still driving a horse and a carriage. You know, I, this is, he's, he's old fashioned. Uh, Look at his clothes. Look at his style. He's got no style. You know, it comes for is he from the 1800s? And they were mocking him. But the farmer paid no attention. He got down out of the horse and his carriage and he began to go towards the school. And he looked up and there in the midst of the students who were mocking him was his son. Well, you can just imagine how he felt. <clears throat> he was all excited to see his boy, who he had made this sacrifice for. And uh, without a word, he turned around and went back down to his horse and his carriage. He went home. And uh, his wife, when he arrived home, said, well, how did it go? He didn't say a word to her. He sat down in the chair, and in the morning she fell to bed. If you will open with me your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. That's a true story. It comes to us from uh, a long time ago, of course, back at the turn of the century, where there was a great difference between the city and the country. Now, of course, uh, most people live in the city, 
and the amenities of the cities have uh, reached into the country for the most part. You can even have satellite TV and high-speed internet in the country. And, uh, you know, there's a, that's a double-edged sword. Mark chapter 14. At the Last Supper, at verse 23, Jesus is taking the bread and the wine, and he takes the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave thanks, he gave it to them, to his disciples, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so you see the sacrifice of blood that the Father makes for his children. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out unto the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said unto them, All of you will be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And in Mark chapter, in Matthew chapter 26, and from our scripture reading, you saw that all of the disciples said, Though everybody will forsake you, we will not forsake you. So said they all. And Jesus said, Jesus said to Peter, Verily I, veil, verily I say unto you, that this day, even in this night, before the rooster crows twice, you shall deny me three times. But Peter spoke the more vehemently, If I should die with you, I will not deny you in any wise. Likewise also said they all. So you see the mentality the shepherd is there with his flock, with his disciples. And he's saying to them, I'm going to be smitten. I'm going to be taken. And tonight, you will all be scattered and you will deny me, Peter. You will deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. He's warning Peter. He's saying, Peter, be on your guard. You're saying you will never deny me. I'm telling you that you will deny me three times. Peter's saying, that is impossible. I will never deny you. Though everybody denies you, though everybody forsakes you, I will never deny you. Not ever. So they went out to the garden. They went out to the garden. Jesus had given his warning. You'll notice that when Jesus gives a warning, he gives the warning, he allows for a response, but he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't come back and say it over and over again. Look, you guys, I'm the, I'm the Son of God. I'm the Messiah, all right? You need to listen to me, okay? Wake up. No, he gave the warning. He tells them what's going to happen. They deny it. They refuse it. Off to the garden they go. Jesus becomes to be very heavy. Verse 34, Mark 14, verse 34. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Wait here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that night, if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And so Jesus is in great agony. The sins of the world are being laid on him. That terrible, mysterious weight that we can never, never fathom was put on the Son of God as he labored for the sins of, of all of us. Amen. As he labored for the sins of all of us with that weight on him and he was praying. And in that time of agony, he came back <clears throat> and he found them sleeping. He found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. And he spoke specifically to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. When he, he returned, he found them asleep again. 
verse 40. And then he told them the third time when he came back, keep sleeping, take your rest. And then after they had slept for a little while, he woke them up and he said, it is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up and let us go. Lo, he that betrays me is at hand. And so you can see in your mind's eye the picture how the moment of crisis had been formulated and it had come. Three and a half years they had been with Jesus. He had given them the warning. Three and a half years in preparation for this great moment where the sins of the world would be laid on the Lamb of God and He would be led to the slaughter. Three and a half years where Jesus had warned them and said, I am going to be crucified. I'm going to be taken. They're going to hit me. They're going to spit on me. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day I will rise again. And they just could not hear that. Whenever they heard that, they, were, they, they said, we can't hear that. We can't hear that. You know, far be it from you, Peter had told him one time that that should ever happen. And the moment had come. The crowd came, Judas was there, he kissed him to identify him, there was a great multitude, and they grabbed a hold of Jesus. And Peter, Peter, he was willing to fight. He was willing to fight. He had a sword with him, and he took his sword, and he drew his sword. And Peter was a powerful man. Peter was in the ocean, fishing. He was walking. Peter was a fine specimen of masculinity. And he took that sword, and he was willing to defend his master. And with all of his great power, he swung it at the head of the chief uh, high priest's servant's ear. Uh, his head, and he cut off his ear. And Jesus immediately loosed his hands from the bonds and picked up the ear and said, just allow me to do this. And he put the ear back on the servant's head, and he healed him right there. And then he allowed his hands to be bound again. And when the disciples saw that, they took off running. And there was a young man, we don't know him, who is identified, but when, when he... When he saw that Jesus was going to permit himself to be taken, he fled naked. And the, 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 the men grabbed his jacket and he, he left stark naked running through the garden to get away. One of the apostles who's not named. They probably did that just out of respect. You know, It was already an embarrassing enough of a story as it was. And then you see how... John and Peter, this is not a new story, you know this story. John and Peter, they follow the multitude. John goes back into the palace. Peter gets in as well. John goes to where the trial is taking place. And the priests and the rulers, they bring all these false accusers in. And they, one person accuses Jesus of this, and one person accuses Jesus of that. And there's this big, huge commotion, and the priests are shouting... And here the Messiah of the world is standing calmly, not saying anything. And John is there in the room, and Peter, who said he would never deny his Savior, went and he warmed himself by the fire outside of the court, where all the servants were. And as he was sitting there in the flickering light of the fire, the servants looked at him and a young girl, she looks at him and she says, you know what, I've seen your face before. She says, you're one of his disciples. No, I'm not. He says, I, I, I don't know that man. I, I, I've never seen him before. I'm not one of his disciples. But Peter thought to himself, you know what, I, I better get away from this fire. I'm going to go sit outside on the steps. So he goes out and sits on the steps. and. He's taking part to some extent in the conversation. And another woman looks at him, young girl, young maid. Maybe she's 16, 17, 18. She's working in the, in the high priest's palace. She's a, she's a server or something. And she says 
to Peter, surely you are one of his disciples. I recognize you. I recognize you. Your speech is the same as theirs. No, I am not one of his. I am not one of his. A little while later, somebody else says to him, surely, listen, you can deny it all you want. Surely, you are one of his disciples. We've seen you. We've seen you doing miracles. We've seen you with the master. We've seen you with Jesus. And he began to curse and to swear. And he said, I do not know that man. I do not know that man. Peter, who was willing to fight to the death with a sword, yet for his personal security, when a girl ridiculed him, when a girl pointed him out, I don't even know that she ridiculed him, but when a girl pointed him out, he was concerned about his popularity, he was concerned about his safety, he was concerned, he was afraid. And in that moment, he denied his Savior three times. And the Bible says, the Bible says, that Jesus turned and looked at him in that moment. In John, let's record it in John, if we could just flip over there, uh, just briefly. The Bible records that John, uh, John records that Jesus looked at him. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's not in John. It must be in Luke. Uh, sorry, uh, since, I, since I do want to read it, let's go there. My notes are on my phone here, but my phone is shut off, so... Um, we'll come, we'll find it. Here it is here. Luke chapter 22. Verse 60. Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he yet spoke, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, I want to tell you, well, first I want to ask, why is this story in the scriptures? Why is this recorded? Four different times in the Gospels. you got to figure, if you're Peter, you're saying to your apostle buddies, look, do you have to put that in there? I mean, really, four times? You know, can't we just, like, delegate this to Mark? You know, he can write about it just briefly. He can mention it. If you, if it, you feel like it has to be mentioned, the Holy Spirit says it has to be mentioned, but four times? Why four times? And not just, this is not like, this is paragraphs and paragraphs of scripture dedicated to this disgraceful, horrific betrayal of the Son of God by somebody who professed loyalty to him with the most ardent passion. It's for our admonition. It's for us. It's for us because we have been there. Every single time for the sake of popularity or for the sake of, of um, securing some advantage or for the sake of protecting our personal Savior, we act in a way that denies our Lord. Amen. We deny Him in the same way that Peter did. Amen. It's the same. Peter was willing to lift a sword to fight to the death. But when a 16-year-old girl says to him, I recognize you, you followed him. He denied it. He denied it. No, that's not me, right? That's not me. I, I don't know what you're talking about. We have to beware of popularity and a concern of popularity and a concern about our personal safety. We have to beware 
For these moments, they come to us, and you never know when the moment is going to come. You never know when there's going to be a circumstance where the question is going to be, are you going to deny your Lord? Now, I think there's a, a, a few things that I really want to draw out from this story. The first is this. Every single time Peter and the apostles in this story, every single time they had an opportunity, there was a test. It was a tremendous opportunity with a blessing hidden in the opportunity. I want to walk back through them, okay? Jesus says to them, you're going to deny me. All right? If they had said to him, Lord, we don't want to deny you. How can we not deny you? We're weak. Please help us not to do that. Okay, so there is an opportunity there in that moment. When they go into the garden, and Jesus goes aside a little ways, and he asks them to pray, that's a test. It's a test. They have an opportunity in that moment to watch and to pray. And there was a blessing in that opportunity. There was a blessing in that opportunity. And there is a blessing in that opportunity for us to watch and to pray. Because the test is coming and we are not strong enough to meet it. Amen. We are not strong enough to meet it. Amen. And we go to sleep figuratively and literally thinking, you know what, I've got this. I'm, I'm in the spot where I'm supposed to be. And then we wake up and the crisis is on us and boom. We fall. But there was an opportunity in that moment. <clears throat> what is the next opportunity? I can tell you this. I don't know Peter. I've never met him. He's been dead for 2,000 years. But I can tell you right now that I'm a human being. And I can tell you right now that Peter would have done anything to go back and to relive these events. Amen. Every single opportunity, let's count them, the, the multitudes come, they take Jesus, everybody scatters. What would it be like in the scriptures if Peter in that moment had said, I can't run, I can't run, I can't. That opportunity in that moment <clears throat> He would have done anything to go back and replay this again. What would it have been like if in the scriptures, the Bible recorded, everybody left except for Peter. And he stood with Jesus, and he was bound with Jesus, and he was led astray to the, to Pilate's pal, uh, to the, to the high priest's palace. Just imagine what that would be like to have as your epitaph for all of humanity, for all of history, for eternity, I was led astray with the Messiah. <clears throat> In the trial, there's all these false accusers. There's all these false witnesses. Peter is sitting close enough to see Jesus. Because we know that when Jesus turned to look at Peter, their eyes met. As recorded in Luke. Their eyes met. And so Peter is in a position, it's not like they have glass porches, okay, and there's, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's a thick wall between them. There is enough space, there is enough of an opening where Peter can hear what is happening. All the false accusations. What would it have been like if the scriptures recorded and Peter came walking into the hall and he said, you're telling it wrong. I was there. You want to know what happened? This is what was said. John could have done the same thing. John was there in the hall. And yet they were silent. It was a missed opportunity. Peter, when he was asked by the girl, surely you're a Galilean. Yes, I'm a Galilean. That's the Messiah in there. Let me tell you about it. That girl, when she asked the question, she was curious. You're one of the people who was with him. I've heard about all the miracles. 
You know, there's been three and a half years of miracles, raising the, the dead and healing the sick and the blind and casting out demons. Tell, tell us what you've seen. No, I don't know him. What a terrible, terrible missed opportunity. In fact, that girl's salvation might have hinged, hinged on that opportunity. Have you ever thought about that? We don't know what happened to her. She could have walked out into the street of Jerusalem and got hit by a bus the next day. You know, the equivalent. Roman transportation. Very unpredictable. But that could have been her salvation right there in that moment. I don't know him. Peter was put in that situation and equipped for that moment, for that purpose, to glorify God. <clears throat> and he failed. Two more times that occurred. Then he went out and he wept bitterly. And when, the, when Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter looked at Jesus, there was no condemnation in that look. And it broke Peter's heart. It broke his heart. When Jesus was led to Pilate, when Jesus was led to Herod, when Jesus was led back to Pilate, when Jesus went to be crucified, there were opportunities in all of those events. They stretched over the course of a day and a half, and the disciples were there, and they did not avail themselves of that opportunity. When Jesus was dying on the cross, the word of the thief came to him. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. And the thief gave Jesus hope. The thief gave Jesus hope. But his apostles were silent. I want you to think about that. What a terrible missed opportunity. What would it have been like if in after years, I can tell you right now, Peter, you know the story. History records that Peter, after he was converted, he became one of the Lord's most ardent followers. And he was boldly pro proclaiming the gospel. And when the time came, Jesus had prophesied to him that they're going to take you and they're going to carry you. You used to go where you wanted to go, but they're going to take you and they're going to carry you where you don't want to go. And they're going to do what they want to do with you. And Peter understood that as being a reference to his death. He knew that that was a reference to the fact that he would be carried away and that he would die for his master. In fact, he, he talks about it in his two books that he wrote. The time has come for me to lay off this tabernacle when I am deceased. Remember these things that I have taught you. Wouldn't Peter have loved when he was hanging upside down on a cross because he refused to allow them to crucify him right side up? It was too great an honor. He was hanging upside down with his head down. Don't you think that Peter would have loved to have four crosses on that hill? Jesus, two thieves, and Peter. What an honor it would have been to be crucified with the Son of God. A missed opportunity. <clears throat> why, did, why, was Peter, why is this recorded, and why was Peter permitted to go through this painful process? Peter was permitted to go through this process because it was necessary for his redemption. It was necessary for his salvation. Because that night, Peter fell on the rock and was broken. And it was necessary for Peter to realize that despite all of his protestations and his professions, that he was a weak man. That he was a weak man. That he was a, that he was a frail man. That he was a boaster. That he was a coward and that he was a traitor. It was necessary for Peter to see those things 
for him to be redeemed. And it was necessary for him to go through this process so that he could become a lion of the gospel. And the key linchpin in Peter's salvation was the kindness of Christ to him in the moment of betrayal. Jesus did not condemn Peter. Turn with me to John chapter 21. 